Aloha. Aloha. You know, we had a great Easter, and then last week we had a great follow-up service. And uh, Easter is also known to the churches as harvest time. And tonight you may be here as part of that harvest that uh, we had during Easter. So this may be your first time here at a Wednesday night service, which is also known as our equip service. And the purpose and the vision behind our equipped service is written in the back of your bulletins, um, actually in Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. And it's to um, help and equip you, the congregation, to understand the Word of God, to bring in understanding, and to help you find an area that God is calling you into to serve uh, in a ministry, to find a purposeful place that God has gifted you. Um, to, to, to start to serve and to, to preach the gospel to all men. That's the purpose of our equipped service. It's a little different from our Sunday services, which our Sunday services are geared towards uh, uh, new believers. And to equip you, we'd ask that you would bring your Bibles to service. And as you came in tonight, you, you are given a bulletin, and you'll notice that in your bulletin, there's, there's, there's no notes in there. There's just lines where you can take your own notes and we want you guys to bring your Bibles, to familiarize yourself with the Bible. And we also want you to follow along, actually listen to the message so that you would um, actually hear God speaking to you personally and, and what God is trying to work into your life. So that you would take down special notes, notes that's uh, only directed to you personally. So that's how we want to equip you. And it will require paying attention. You know, I'm reminded of a time I was speaking up here, and um, um, I gave an address to, of a scripture, and um, Stan Aoki, Stan Aoki here? Stan, my good friend. Stan stood up and actually stopped the service and said, hey, pastor, that's, that's a wrong scripture. And he was right. He was actually right. And, and me trying to justify myself, yeah, yeah, I was just testing you guys, you know, uh, old habits, you know, and because I, I always respond that way. So, so you know, I did that. But then, you know, I went home, going home that night, and my wife and I was laughing about it. And then she told me this. She said, "That's good. That means that people are paying attention." They're paying attention, and that's what we want you guys to do, to actually pay attention so that you'd grasp something of what God is speaking into your hearts so that you can actually write down your own notes on how God is working in your life and then take those notes and apply it. Apply it in your walk. Apply it in your life outside of the church. Amen? Amen. Last week, Pastor Sheldon opened us up with a new series, History and the Authenticity of the Bible. So just to recap a, uh, recap a couple of things, Pastor said that there are a lot of versions, different versions of the Bible. And although over 40 authors wrote the Bible, the original manuscript was translated into different versions to help us to understand and to help us comprehend the Bible in an easier way. The Bible came into existence through God. It was through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the different authors that they began to write the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16, if you've got your Bibles, you can open to 2 Timothy 3.16, which states it this way, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And as Pastor Sheldon said last week, we may ask, well, which Bible version would be right for me to read. Well, I'd say this, that it all depends on you. That, that's completely up to you. And for some of us, we enjoy the King James Version. I do. I enjoy the King James Version. When I read that version, it, it kind of makes the words jump out to me in sort of a poetic way. That I would actually hear Jesus speaking as he would be back in, the, in those days. So I enjoy those uh, the King James Version. But I also use different versions to bring clarity 
onto what God is actually saying through the scriptures. Because sometimes they, um, I'll be reading the King James and say, what? You know, King James is the Tao, these, yay, and all that stuff. But then I'd say, go to the NIV and I say, oh, okay, got it. And then I'll, I'd have a more understanding. And maybe for some of you, that's you. The NIV version or the Living Translation, that's an easier um, type of reading for you to comprehend. And that's what we want you to do, to find a Bible as long as it's the Holy Bible and not any other book that claims to be the Word of God. I'd say this, if you find the Holy Bible, one that you could comprehend and read, then you'll be fine, just as long as it's the Holy Bible. So the Bible came into existence through the Spirit of God as he spoke to the different authors, inspiring them to record his words. Pastor Sheldon also spoke on the authenticity, the, the genuineness of his word. Through my experience of reading the Bible, this is what I've, I've come to know and, and believe. That if God spoke it, and I believe it, and I recognize this, that word to be the true and authentic word of God. And that's called faith. That's called trusting in God. But listen, our faith in God can be tested. And it will be tested. Because the word of God has been under attack by the world and by the enemy from the beginning of time. I've been tested by a lot of people who challenged me about the Bible. They say, ah, the Bible is just another book written by man. It's just a book filled with fables and, and great stories. It's not real. And a lot of these guys who issued the challenge, they, they've never read the Bible. They have a misguided view of the nature of God, of whether God exists or not. So a lot of them don't really believe or, or stand firm on their statement. They're just repeating what other people have said to them or what they heard from other people or what they've seen on the television or what the media said about the Bible. They're just repeating it. And I call that a, a direct attack on God's word by the enemy. You see, folks, if Satan can keep us from reading and believing God's word, then he's doing his job. He is. The word says that he came to kill, steal, and destroy. And if he can keep you and me from hearing and trusting in God's word, then he'll kill our faith. And he'll steal our hope. And he'll destroy the authenticity of God's word and his purpose for our lives. 1 Peter 5, 8, and you can turn there. 1 Peter 5.8 says this. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But I want to say this, that the Bible is the infallible word of God. It is true and it is everlasting. It withstood this... The, the test of time, and we can see the evidence of the attack on God's word to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The attack started way back then in the book of Genesis, and it's still attacked in today's society by the world, by people who still question the authenticity of the Bible. And Pastor Sheldon spoke about this from the book of Genesis. When the serpent quest, questioned God's word, before Eve in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 2, 15 to 17. And I know I'm moving kind of quick here, so Genesis 2, you guys can turn all the way to the front, the first book of the Bible. Genesis 2, 15 to 17. And it reads this way. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then the attack comes in Genesis 3, 1. 
and he had reached this way. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, and here's the attack, Has God indeed said? Has God indeed said? You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. That was a direct attack on the authenticity of God's word. You see, when the, the serpent questioned God's word before Eve in the garden, it brought a sense of doubt into Eve's mind of what God really said. It killed her faith. He stole her hope and he destroyed the life that God had planned for Adam and Eve and for the entire human race. That's why it's important for us as believers to trust and rely on God's Word, the Bible. If we don't, we'll be easily distracted from the truth of God's Word and begin to compromise. We'll compromise His Word and we'll question our faith because we don't know the authenticity of God's Word, the genuine Word of God. And if we don't know the authenticity, how will we be able as Christians to rely and to trust in His Word? Reliability is a very important aspect for us as believers. And tonight I want to address the, the accuracy and the, the authority the Bible holds for us as a believer. The question that's frequently asked is this, is the Bible the reliable Word of God? Is it trustworthy? Well, there are two issues that we should know as Christians about the reliability of the Bible. First, you have to know how accurate its statements are. You have to know the, the actuality of the Word before you can begin to trust and rely on the Word. And when you say that you're going to rely and you're going to trust on anything, then you're putting everything you have into it. You're putting everything you have on the line, trusting that it'll come true for you. You know, I remember when, uh, when my brothers and I, uh, we wanted to build this uh, tree house. And uh, we, we, we were on this really tall mango tree about, you know, 40, 50 feet high. Uh, more like 10 feet, I think. When, you know, when you're young, you know, everything seems higher, right? So, you know, so it was more like 10 feet, but, but we were planning to build this tree house and, and we're looking around the home for some lumber and my grandparents had a stack of lumber um, from, from their old house and so we were picking out some lumber and uh, we grabbed some old lumber, we, we grabbed some nails and we grabbed some hammer and, a hammer and then we went up on that tree and my brother started um, putting the cross piece on, uh, on two piece, pieces of branches that was kind of level, so we put a cross piece on there, and then uh, he, he um, put on the, 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 an old plywood on, top there, uh, on that cross piece. And the, it was actually looking pretty good. The structure was looking pretty good until they told me, try stand on them and see if it holds. <laughs> it was at that point that no matter how good the structure was, I wasn't going to place my life on that structure. So I started weighing out the facts. First of all, the wood was old, and if I stood on there, I was thinking it would probably break, and I'd fall 40, 50 feet, which actually was 10. <laughs> and then my, uh, my brother, you know, none of us had any carpentry skills, so I couldn't trust his carpentry skills, you know. N when I looked at him, nothing about him told me that he was a carpenter. You know? I didn't even know if he could pound one nail or not. So I couldn't trust in his credibility. I couldn't trust in the lumber, the durability of the lumber, and I couldn't trust in his credibility as a carpenter. And isn't that the same with the Word of God, with the Bible? If there's no credibility to the accuracy to, or accuracy to it, how can we rely on it? But the Bible is accurate in its statements. And it does hold its own credibility. And behind the, the issue of reliability stands the veracity of Jesus. 
big words, eh? <laughs> Get them, you know. Check out Google. You can find them all. Yeah. Yeah. So turn your Bibles to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, and we're going to be in verse 18. And I'm going to read from the King James Version. And, and, and the scenario is Jesus is now speaking to the people, and it's the Sermon on the Mount. And this is what Jesus says. Matthew 5, 18. For verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Jesus is pretty straightforward of the reliability of God's word. He gave us a strong statement dealing with the accuracy of the Bible. He's saying that the Bible will withstand the test of time. Even when heaven and earth passes away, God's word will stand. It will still stand firm. It will stand strong. And it will stand true. Everything God predicts in his word will be fulfilled. And until it is, not one jot or tittle will pass away. He's saying that you can take this promise to the bank. You can count on the Bible to do everything that it says it would. And Jesus said, not even the smallest jot or a little tittle of the Hebrew letters is out of place in the Bible. That's how credible the Bible is. That even the smallest letter or the, uh, the smallest mark makes a huge difference in the manuscripts, in the writing of the meaning of the Word of God. Every letter of the original, original manuscript was placed precisely for a specific meaning. Just in that, we can see the inerrancy of the Word of God, that there's no error, there's no mistakes in the Bible. But many will claim that that's not true, that there are errors in the Bible. You know what? The Bible is the most criticized book ever written. And many scholars have written books and have attempted to discredit the, author, uh, the authority of the Bible. And again, that's one of Satan's goals, to get man to doubt the Word of God. You see, folks, many of us know what we believe. We do. We just don't know why we believe that. That's why it's important for us to study the evidence of the authority and the divine origin of the Bible. So we have, so that we have the knowledge to make a strong defense of our faith when the enemy comes and try to place doubt and when the enemy comes to attack us. So tonight, let's look at some of the evidence of the Bible's authority. Let's look at the eternal evidence which is the evidence found within the Bible itself. First, the Bible is self-proclamation. It claims to be the Word of God. And we know from 2 Timothy 3.16 that every scripture was inspired by God. The authors were inspired to write the words of God, but they may not have fully understood what they were writing at the moment, at the time, but they we just led to do it. Second Peter, and you can turn there, Second Peter one twenty one tells us this these men they didn't move by their own will. They moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. They wrote by the power of the Holy Spirit. Second Peter one twenty one says it this way For prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So these authors never wrote down anything according to their own will, but by the will of God. And every prophetic word of events came to them by God. Even Jesus saw that the Old Testament writings were to be the, the authoritative word of the Father. 
the authoritative word of God himself. He quoted from the Old Testament throughout his entire ministry. So if the Holy Spirit inspired the word to these guys, and having them recorded on the pages of the Bible, then how much more will the Holy Spirit confirm the word of God to us as he lives within us and as we read the Bible? And that's another piece of evidence of the authority of the Bible, the Holy Spirit. The one who inspired the word confirms the word. John 16, 13 states it this way, and you can turn there. John 16, 13. And it reads this way. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. See, the Holy Spirit who convicts the world of sin will also assure us that the Bible is the infallible word of God. Which brings me to another piece of evidence of the authority that the Bible holds. The Bible holds the power and the authority to convict us of sin. But it also holds the power of grace to forgive us of sin. And it holds a transforming authority to change people's lives. I stand here before you tonight and I testify of this transforming power that the Bible contains. The Bible changed my life. You know, I'm not a reader. But if I do decide to read a book, once I'm done with reading that book, I put it down and I never pick it up again. But it's different. It's different with the Bible. It has the transforming ability to change people's lives, just, not just for a moment, but it changes our lives for all eternity. And I've read the Bible true and true for years, and I can say this, I haven't put it down yet. This book is different. The Bible transforms me every day. Every time I get into it, it has the ability to change my life. It has the ability to change the way I perceive things every day. It refreshes me every time I read it. You know, this past Monday, I was... Uh, I was feeling a little discouraged and um, a little down on some of the things that's, that's happening with Camp Agape. And, and uh, I asked God, hey, why am I feeling this way? Why, I, why is my spirit so downcast? And, and, um, because there's, there's, there's so much that's required to, to put on a camp like this. So I was thinking, and, and it's because of, of our flesh. It's because that you and I as Christians now have the spirit of excellence. We, all, we, we want to do things with a passion, but we want to do things well. And we want to make sure that everything goes good. So uh, I was kind of questioning God's ability for, for provision and, and actually questioning myself, uh, am I doing my best? Is, is everything going to be good? Is everything going to be okay? And for most of the part of, of Monday, um, I just drained myself in worry. I did. Then I finally fell asleep, and then the next morning, I got up and I headed for Starbucks to do my devotions. And you guys are not going to believe this, but it was Second, Second Corinthians 9, the exact scripture that Wilford read tonight that encouraged me that everything will be well. He said, he will give me seed for this special event and I will provide all things and he comforted my soul at that very moment see the Bible is filled with promises and truths and it encourages us every time listen every time that we see God in his word the Bible always brings forth life 
And that's why our daily devotion to God's word is a must. It provides us with a defense when the attacks of the enemy come to doubt and comes upon us. And last week, Pastor Sheldon, uh, he issued a challenge to us that our youth is starting a, a 30-day challenge and they are, they've already started reading the Bible and doing their devotions. Your children, your teenagers are doing it and we want you guys to jump on. Many of you have started and, and you've been doing it and that's great, good job in doing that. But if you're thinking about starting, then, then this is a starting point. I'd say go get them. Go get them. And if this is something that you want to do to get you started on devotions, then let us know. And then in, your, in your bulletins tonight, you, we put this in there. If you guys got this, just sign up on this. Sign on this and then turn it in to, to the information center and you'll get a call from someone checking on you to make sure that we are accountable to you as you get started to, to do this 30-day uh, devotional. When we start to do God's Word, devotions, watch what God will do in your lives. Watch what God's going to do in the lives of these kids that, that's already started doing this thing. So if you don't have what, one of those slips, go check out our information center tonight and they will give you a, a more information on that. So go do the 30-day challenge. They say that if you do something for 30 days, it creates a habit. This, devotions, is a good habit to get into. Amen? The Word of God will transform your life. It has that kind of authority to it. Hebrews 4.12 states it this way. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Folks, the Bible is not just an ordinary book. It holds the power to transform lives. It has changed lives of, of drug addicts. It's changed lives of criminals, murderers, government officials. It's changed the life of business people. And that's just to mention just a few of people. It has changed lives of every walk of life. The Bible does that. No other book can claim to do that. The Bible holds the power of the living God. And it's through His Spirit that lives are saved and transformed. The Bible is the living Word of God, the powerful Word of God, which cuts us to and fro. And what that means, it convicts us of sin, but it also empowers us to defeat sin. It searches into the deepest part of our heart and soul and brings forth things that we may have suppressed so deep down inside of us and that we may have forgotten about. But it will also provide us with the power to forgive and the power to release our pain and our hurts. These are the eternal evidence that we have to support the authority of the Bible, what the Bible says. But the best evidence is the evidence of the unity in which the Bible came into existence. As we know, the Bible covers a lot of topics, a lot of subjects throughout the different books. But yet, it doesn't contradict itself. Here's what's amazing about that one statement. So we're going to look at the facts about why the Bible is that amazing. First, the Bible was written over a time span of 1,500 years. Secondly, more than 40 men wrote the Bible from every walk of life. Here's some examples. Moses was educated in Egypt and became a prophet over Israel. Peter, Peter was a fisherman. Solomon was one of the wisest kings ever. Luke 
was a doctor. Amos was a shepherd. And Matthew was a tax collector. All the writers had a different occupation and background. Third, the Bible was written on three different continents. It was written in Asia, Africa, and Europe. Moses wrote in the desert of Sinai. Paul wrote from the prison in Rome. Daniel wrote during the exile in Babylon. And Ezra wrote in the ruins of the city of Jerusalem. Here's the fourth fact. The Bible was written under different circumstances of the author's lives. David wrote in the time of war. Jeremiah wrote at the sorrowful time of Israel's downfall. Joshua wrote while invading the land of Canaan. And Peter wrote while Israel was under Roman domination. And here's the fifth fact. The author's had different purposes for writing. Isaiah wrote to warn Israel of God's coming judgment of their sin. Zechariah wrote to encourage the disheartened Israel who had returned from Babylonian exile. Matthew wrote to prove to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. And Paul wrote addressing the problems in the different churches of Asia and Europe. Now as we look at all of these factors and we put all of these factors together, the Bible was written over 1,500 years ago by 40 different authors at different places under various circumstances and it addresses a multitude of issues. And I consider it amazing, amazing that in such diversity there is such unity in the Bible. That the unity is structured around one team and one purpose. God's redemption plan for mankind and all of creation. Hundreds of controversial subjects are addressed, and yet the authors do not contradict each other. The Bible is incredible. And if you were to ask ten different authors in today's society, to write their views on a, on a specific subject, do you think that they would agree? I don't think so. You'd have a lot of different opinions and a lot of disagreements. But look at the authorship of the Bible. All the authors over a span of 1,500 years, writing on many different subjects, and they never, ever contradict one another. Listen, this can only mean one thing. That there was one author who guided the whole process of creating the Bible. God himself. To the power of the Holy Spirit. To me, the unity in which the Bible was created is pretty good evidence that the Bible is and will always be the infallible Word of God, the true Word of God. Again, 1 Peter 2.21, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Amen? You may close your Bibles and put away your notes. Again, we encourage you to get into the Word of God. It is the infallible Word. The Bible is true. Jesus said that this Word shall never pass away. All heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will never pass away. Folks, when it's all said and done, His Word will still stand. And it will stand firm within you and I. But I can tell you one thing, that the Bible is not finished. Because he's still writing it in you and I. And there's one prophecy 
that still remains. And that's seeing each and every one of you in heaven one day. When that comes to pass, then everything will be fulfilled because the Bible does say that death is the last enemy to be defeated. Would you bow your hearts in me, with me as we pray? Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the authenticity of your word, Father God, that only you could have orchestrated uh, uh, such a thing, Lord God, that to 40 people in, in, in three different continents over a, a span of 1,500 years, Lord God, that you would speak to all of these men, Lord God, and, and inspire them to write, Lord God, not knowing what they're, they're writing, but confirming what you're saying. And then that your word would, would go and stand to, to the test of time and still, Lord God, is one of the most powerful books ever written. And that your word has the power to transform the lives of your people. And that within all these authors writing at all different times, Lord God, there was one purpose behind it and that was to to bring men back to you. And Father, the power that you used way back then to encourage these men and inspire them is still evident today in us as you inspire us to write and take notes of what you're saying in our lives. You're continuing to write the Bible within us. So Father, would you continue to do that for our lives? Continue to write. Continue to mold and transform our lives. That the true authenticity of your word will come to life within us, Father. So we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your power. We thank you for the Bible, which is true and everlasting. To you be all glory and honor. In Jesus' name, and the congregation would say, Amen. Amen.